Anyway, the message this morning is about being encouraged. How many of you want to come into a place where you feel like you are welcome? Anybody ever been? Now listen, uh, listen, how many of you have ever walked into a church and you felt as if you were on an island that no one knew that you were there? You ever walked in, in fact, that maybe you've been in a church that was a, maybe a big church and a lot of folks were there and, and you walked by everyone. In fact, even someone came to the pulpit and they said, hey, listen, you're new here. And if you are, if you'll go back to the visitor center, we want to say hi to you. And then your thought was, well, why didn't you say hi to me when I walked in? You ever felt like that? How many of you believe that when you walk into what we classify as the family of God, which, you know, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we came to worship our Lord together. Amen, church. So if someone that we don't know walks into this local family, should we not make them feel welcome? I want to thank you, Fellowship of the Hills, for being that kind of church. I go throughout the community, and everyone says, you know, Fellowship of the Hills, we don't know what to say about their pastor, but we can sure tell you they're a welcoming bunch of folks. And that makes me feel good. Susan and I, just this past week, uh, we were with our daughter, and we had a wonderful time worshiping in their church. She's a staff member there, and, and uh, what a blessing it was to be there. They have an incredible welcome center. In fact, they have a whole coffee center. It was just really cool. But I tell you what, I missed being with my family. I got to be with a new family, and it was kind of cool to hang out with them and, and meet their pastor and, and meet many of their folks. But you know what? I missed my local family. Amen, church. Anybody ever go away and you missed being at church with your local family? Amen. Well, listen, folks, I pray that when you walked into the house this morning that you felt welcome. Because, see, when, you're felt, when you feel welcome, you feel encouraged. Would you not agree with me? And that's the message that God has for us today. How many of you believe that the church, the family of God, needs to be a place, needs to be a church that is encouraging? Amen, church? You don't need anybody to, to make you feel worse than you already do, right? How many of you, if you walk into a place and you feel bad and somebody walks up to you and says, hey, listen, let me tell you how sick I am today. Let me tell you about how bad my week's been. You're having a bad day and a bad week. How many of you want to hear that kind of stuff? I don't. I want to see somebody smile at me. I want to, I want to have somebody encourage me. You know, I was just joking with some of the men back there. Sometimes the, the pastor, first thing on a Sunday morning, someone's got to grab him and say, hey, let me tell you about a problem we got. Hey, listen, folks, I got six other days you can call me with your problem. Amen? Six other days. Please don't bother me with your problem before the Lord's bringing the message this morning. Amen, church? Listen, I want to be encouraged. Amen? And I want to encourage you this morning. That's the message that I believe that God has for us today. In fact, a little history about this. About 51 AD, Paul and, and Silas and Timothy uh, they were on their second missionary journey. In fact, Europe, they had, uh, had spent some time there at Philippi delivering the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they were there at Thessalonica, the church of Thessalonica, delivering the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel. And what was happening is there was this incredible growth that was taking place at the church of Thessalonica. And this information was getting back to Paul, and, and Paul wants to encourage the growth of what's taking place there at Thessalonica. So therefore, he writes these letters. It's going to take us to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're only going to visit a few verses this morning. In fact, our key verse is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. It's up on the screen for you. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version this morning. I encourage you to follow along with me. I love to hear the rustling of the pages. Listen, I know we live in a technological time, and there's nothing wrong if you want to zoom in on, on your uh, electronic device. But I'll tell you what, there's just nothing like rustling through the pages of the Word of God. Nothing like being able to highlight uh, the message that God has for us today. The key verse this morning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, and this is what it says. Follow along with me. It says, therefore, encourage one another. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. So this morning, if I was just to stop here and say, listen, this is your memory verse for the week. How many of you would leave this place? You know what? One thing I learned in church this morning is when I leave, I need to be an encourager to other people. Thank you so much. It's okay. You can say amen, praise the Lord, lift your hand, all that good stuff here. Amen. You can do that. To encourage one another. To build up one another. Now, if I was to ask you this morning to lift your hands, how many of you say, you know what, Pastor? I'm one of those this morning that need to be encouraged. I need to be built up. Maybe that's you this morning. 
Well, I thought about the word encourage, and and this is what Merriam-Webster says. You can see the definition there. It says to give support, to show confidence or hope to someone, to give support and advice to someone so that they will do or continue to do something. Hey, listen, how many of you have ever worked in a secular job out into the workforce, and you've had others work for you? You were a supervisor. Anybody in here? How many of you have worked for those supervisors, and all they had to say was something that you did wrong? And maybe you've worked for someone, worked for them, and, 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 and it was all about fear. You didn't want to mess up. But then again, how many of you, and I pray that I was that kind of supervisor. I did my best to encourage others. They say, never tell someone that they did something wrong until you tell them they did something right. Amen? That's the same thing with our children. Never tell them something they've done wrong until you tell them you've done something right. I don't want to break their will. I want to break and discipline them in the thing that they need to do right. But I don't want to break their will. I want to encourage them to do what? To do right. I want to be that kind of supervisor. I want to be that kind of parent. I want to be that kind of Christian. Amen, church? And there's a recipe that Paul gives us in these verses to encourage one another, to build one another up. I thought about some quotes this morning. Let me throw a couple of these out of you. William Ward said this. He says, you can flatter me, and I may not believe you. You can criticize me, and I may not like you. You can ignore me, and I may forgive you. But if you encourage me, I will never forget you. Isn't that true? You don't forget those that encourage you. It reminded me of a school teacher. Where are my school teachers at this morning? I thought, you know what? I wish they would have done this in my class, especially at seventh grade. That was a tough time for me. This teacher, she thought she would teach a lesson about encouragement. So what she did is she had all of the students take a piece of paper. And on the paper, she asked the students to look around the room and write the name of every other pupil, every other student in the class, in their class, write it down on one line, skip a space, and write the next student's name on the other line. So they did that. And once she she knew that all the students had all of the names of every student written on the papers, she said, now in that blank line, write down everything that you like, everything that is encouraging to you about that person. And so they took the rest of the morning to fill out those papers about all the good things, all the nice things, all the encouraging things that they could say about every pupil in their classroom. And then the teacher collected all the papers. And that night she went home and she took each student's name, Joseph, Regina, and she went down the list. And she wrote all of those things on a single piece of paper. For example, it might have been Dalton. She had all of those things that everybody said about Dalton. All those things that everybody said about Joseph. All those things that everybody said about Jimmy. And you know what she did the next morning? She took those papers and she passed them out to each of the students. And she said the most amazing thing happened. The students would come to her after class and say that I never knew I was liked by anybody else. I never knew that anybody else thought that much of me. This morning, I thought what we should do is probably just read this verse and I should pass out a piece of paper and have you fill out the name of every person in the church and write something encouraging about that person. Wouldn't it be neat to know what others think of you that's encouraging and uplifting? Wouldn't that be neat to know that? So here's what you do. Get a piece of paper and put my name on it. You write it out and pass it forward. I need to hear it this morning. So Paul gives us a message about being an encourager. As we look on at the text, I want you to follow along. Our text this morning as we go into these verses of 12 through 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, notice what it says. It says, but we request of you, Paul and and, and all of the ministers of the church, all the ministers of the gospel, as Paul is writing this letter, he says, we... All of the leadership of the church, we request of you, brethren. Notice when he says the word brethren, he is speaking to who, church? To us, fellow believers in Jesus Christ, our brothers and sisters. So Paul is saying, hey, listen, brother, hey, listen, sister. They're at the church of Thessalonica. This is what I write to you. He says that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. 
We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays evil with evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Well, I tell you what, as the Lord impressed upon me on this message this week about being an encourager, about my prayer as God continues to grow Fellowship of the Hills, that we don't lose sight. We don't lose sight of loving one another. That we don't find ourselves as we grow and, and as God's doing an amazing work in this church, that there'll be a click over here and a click over here. And, and all of a sudden we've got a reserved seat and someone says, wait a minute, hold on, you're sitting in my seat. I know churches like that, amen? We want everyone to feel welcome, everyone to feel as if they have their place in the house of the Lord. So as I was looking at this and this incredible growth that's taking place there, the church of Thessalonica, and as Paul is writing this letter, I want you to notice the very first point. Now, I got a kick out of Stuart last week. I, as I finished our, uh, our, our service there at, in, in uh, Wichita, I pulled up online and I watched Stuart's message. What a great message Stuart preached last week. And I love it where he said, yes. And I love it where he said, you know, every message should have three points. We already know this pastor doesn't do three-point messages. They can be 15 points at times. Well, this morning, this was only got two, and some of you are looking at your watch going, amen. It's got two points this morning, and here's the first one. The first point is this. I want you to notice there. Look at verse number 12 and 13. It says, but we request of you, we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them in very high love. Because of their word. So here's your first point this morning. Write this down. You write it on the back of your bulletin or write it off to the side there in the margin. We must encourage our spiritual leaders. We must encourage our spiritual leaders. I want to read something to you that was written back on April 2nd, just this past April, this year. It was written in, an, in a magazine called Church Leaders. I stay in tune with all the different writings that's going on. I'm, I, I, I try to stay, uh, stay in tune with what's happening, not only in the country, but in the world, as it relates to the church itself. And this gentleman, Tim Peters, wrote this article. It says, the 10 real reasons why pastors quit too soon. The 10 real reasons why pastors quit too soon. You know what the number one reason was, church? Lack of encouragement. The number one reason was discouragement. It said the number one reason of the 10 was discouragement. And he wrote on this by saying this, more than 1,700 pastors will leave the ministry every month. 1,700 pastors will leave the ministry every month. This staggering number includes some of the brightest, most inspiring pastors in this country. The number one reason of the 10 is discouragement. Complaints speak louder than compliments. A pastor can receive 15 compliments, but it's that one complaint that will haunt him every day. You must be very careful as a leader of the church, and I've had to learn this over the 18 years of ministry, not to be focused on the complaints, to be focused on the seeds that are planted. So many times we are worried about the harvest and not realize that it's the seeds that are planted that God has called us to plant. He's called me to set the table to deliver, a meat, to deliver the meat and the message that he has for you. He has not called me to force feed you. Amen. He's called me to deliver the message, to set the table. Uh, you all know I can't stand peas. I'll promise you if you serve peas, I won't eat it. But there will be others that will. Amen, church? Amen. You know, sometimes when we hear the message, it can step on our feet. Amen? It's pretty tough. So don't, don't get mad at me because I put peas on the table. Maybe the Lord has those peas for someone else. Amen, church? So the reality is this. We must be careful. Listen, we must encourage the spiritual leaders of the church. I am so blessed. I am so blessed to pastor a church where Susan and I are loved by the family of God. And I want to thank you for that. I am so blessed. There are so many pastors. Listen, there are so many pastors that are suffering today because they are not loved by their congregation. 
And they get up faithfully every Sunday. They get up uh, faithfully every day during the week and counsel and go to various meetings and hospital visits and do exactly what the Holy Spirit has called them to do. But yet they're not encouraged by the congregation. They're not encouraged by those that they feed. You know, the Word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, it says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Did you know that I give an account for what I do up here this morning? Do you know I give an account for what I do during the week as I minister? Not only the gospel and the saving grace of Jesus Christ, but as I go and I minister and I commune with others. Do you know I give an account for my testimony as well? Why is that? Because I'm held to a different standard than you. I'm held as a spiritual leader of this church. But notice this, it continues in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. It says, let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Isn't that amazing? The Word of God says that, listen, you obey your spiritual leaders because they have a what? A responsibility over you. And they're going to be held accountable for what they do and what they preach and what they share and all those things that they do in the ministry. But let me tell you something. The Word of God also says that you are held accountable on how you treat those that have authority over you in the church. Did you know that? How do I know that to be true? Well, I tell you, my 18 years of ministry, I have seen the power of God's judgment over congregations that did exactly what the Word of God told them not to do. I've seen doors that have had to close up and lock up. I've seen doors that on the outside, Ichabod, which means God's not here, written on the outside of those churches because they wanted to be like them and not what He called them to be. I've seen men and women of God abused by congregations and as these 1,700 leave the ministry. How sad. How sad. It's not too long ago I remember that I was, and I've shared this illustration, so I won't belabor you with it anymore. But when I was at Forest Heights Baptist Church, which no longer exists, by the way, I'll never forget a lady on my second council meeting there. I was sent to help this church out. The association sent me there to help them. They had already lost their entire staff, walked out on a Wednesday night because of the abuse of this church. And they said, Marty, will you go and see if you can get this church back on the right track to get them to understand it's not about them. It's not about their building. It's not about their cause. This is about the name of Jesus Christ. And I said, I'll go. And they said, it should take you about three months. I was there for 19 months. And while I was there, the second council meeting and I w- that I was at, they had this incredible freezer or fr- refrigerator that was built for their flower ministry. They thought more of their flowers than they did of people. It was amazing. They had a brand new bus that they, they, they went on all their excursions with but didn't want to go into the community and deliver the gospel of Jesus Christ to a community. And as I stood in that second council meeting, There was a lady there, and I had been set up by one of the deacons. It was a funny thing. The deacons had already pulled me off to the side before the meeting. said, Pastor, what do you think about flowers being uh, put up on uh, on uh, on on the remembrance table and having the Word of God removed before every service? I said, well, that's not really cool. I said, the Word of God should be the centerpiece of His church, not flowers. We can use the flowers and honor people out in the vestibule or somewhere else. We don't need to honor people in the church. We honor our Lord. And his word is the centerpiece. And I just happened to say that in a parting comment to this deacon. So in that meeting, the deacon says, hey, he looks over this lady named Carol. He says, Carol, pastor's got something to say to you about putting flowers up on a remembrance table on Sundays. I said, well, it's been opened up. And I very gently, very peacefully, and very lovingly said, Carol, if you could do this for me. On those that we honor on Sundays uh, for their birthdays and anniversaries and all those other things, could we put those flowers in the vestibule? Can we leave the word of God there at the center? That woman stood up, pointed her finger at me, and she says, as long as you're here, I'll never do another thing in this church. Keep in mind, this was only my second meeting. That lady stormed out. Susan was outside visiting with other ladies. And Susan said, what did he do? (laughs) So I got in the car, and Susan said, what in the world happened? And I shared with her what had happened. I said, honey, we just need to pray for her. And I thought the next morning, you know, all right, when things kind of cool down, I'll call and see if I can go meet with her. Many of you may know this story. I've shared it before. That morning, her husband called me up. She passed away in her sleep. I began to shake. 
Because I went back to this verse that says we must be careful on how we treat the leaders, the men and women of God. He said, I don't have any special powers. I didn't pray that day or say, hey, Lord, if somebody comes after me, zap them, let them have it. There are times I'd like to, but I don't. But the reality is this, we must be careful. It went on in that ministry, and you keep in mind I was there because the, you had to understand what was taking place in this church. It was all about them. We took that bus, and, and man, I tell you, we prayed over that, and I said, folks, as we were getting through this series of conferences to, to try to bring this church back where God wanted it to be, that it was not about them, it was about Him, I said, we need to take this bus and put it out in the community. We need to reach the lost out there. It's not about you. It's not about all the things you do. Nothing wrong with all those activities, but it needs to be about Jesus. And there was so much resistance for that. So much. One of the deacons came up to me and says, I'm leaving. I'm not coming back. He says, we won't have those type in this church, not while I'm here. I said, what type are you talking about? You see, this church was in a, an interracial and mixed community. They wanted to be an all-white church. I said, well, as long as I'm the pastor here. They're welcome here. Kind of bold, but anyway. Uh, so he left. He left. He left. Months later, months later, I was called to Tallahassee Memorial Hospital where that man died. Had a heart attack eating ice cream with his daughter. I was there for 19 months. We worked through those issues at that church, and I helped that church call a young man out of seminary. His name was Josh. That young man was there for six years. After I had left, some of those that thought that they could control the church, guess what they did? They came back, and they literally ate up that young man. I, I warned him. I said, you take a stand on the Word of God and speak out when you need to speak out. Encourage proper behavior in the church. And they chewed him up. And that young man left the ministry. It's been about two years now that the chairman of the deacon board called me up to preach the last message at Forest Heights Baptist Church when they sold that church to City Church in Tallahassee because they wanted it to be all about them. It was a mixed blessing for me because I knew God was going to take that church with City Church and do some amazing things. But they had not learned their lesson. They had not learned that it was about encouraging and, and following the leadership that God had placed in front of them. In James chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that such will incur a stricter judgment. Listen, I caution any pastor, any teacher, you make sure it's a calling and not a job. I can't tell you how many folks will call me up and say, Pastor, listen, I'm looking to get a job there at Fellowship of the Hills. The Lord's called me to be a youth pastor. And then the next question is, what do you pay? I said, dude, you ain't the one. <laughs> if you're more worried about money, then it ain't a calling. Amen, Amen church? Because if, if, if it's a calling, you know what the, you know, listen, you know what the disciples did? You know what those, them fishermen did that, that had just caught the most incredible man? I tell you what, if CNN, and, well, CNN probably wouldn't have been there, but if Fox News would have been there, they would have reported the most incredible fishing expedition on the Sea of Galilee. You know what those guys did when they got back to shore and all the boats were filled? They left it there to follow Jesus. Amen? It's got to be about a calling. So I warn these men, I say, listen, God holds us to a different standard. He holds us to the responsibility of those that we minister to. So folks, that's why it's important to encourage your leaders. Because God commands that we encourage the leadership within our church. Well, I'll tell you what. I was beaming with joy last week. You know why I was beaming with joy last week? Because I love Stuart. I love Stuart. I love Stuart because I know his heart for the Lord. I love Stuart because he got up and he shared his heart. Upstairs right now, we've got some folks that are sharing their heart with these kids. Man, they are loving on them. They are teaching them the Word of God. You know what? They are spiritual leaders in this church. Amen? 
hey, listen, they can't hear us. They don't know we're doing. Can you just give them a hand for the Lord? Man, that's awesome to me. Yeah. You know, right now, right now, somebody up there, their little nose is running. And you know what that teacher's doing? Going over wiping it off and loving on that child. And sure the good. You know what? Those are spiritual leaders. And so, you know what we need to do? We need to encourage them. Wouldn't you not agree with me, church? Amen. Man, I tell you, we got some guys walking around in these little tan shirts, Fellowship of the Hills on them. That's our safety team. If one of you guys keel over, they got the AED thing in there, they're going to zap you. <laughs> if the Lord doesn't bring you back and calls you home, I'm going to preach your, your funeral right here. Amen. But the reality is, these guys walk around and, and they're our safety team members. Are they ministers within this church? Yes or no? Yeah. Amen. We need to love on them and appreciate them. Hey, listen, in just a couple of weeks, we're getting ready to call this man right here, Clayton Reeves, to be our associate pastor of evangelism and outreach. Yeah. Praise yeah. God for that. Yeah. Praise God. Guess what? We need to love on that man. On Wednesday nights, this young man back here, Keith, has been leading a series on Revelation. That is a tough series to to teach. You know what? During that time, as he's giving that instruction, is he a leader within the church? Yes or no? Absolutely he is. Do we need love on him? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, we do. Hey, listen, we've got folks that are sitting back there right now, and they're doing all the bells and whistles, all this stuff that's happening. Are they ministers within this church? Yeah. Yes, they are. We need love on them. You know, they don't, they don't, they, you, some of you don't even know who they are. Hey, wave at them back there. Wave at them. Look at them. They're all embarrassed now. Yeah. They are ministers within this church. We need to love on them. Hey, listen, did you know that on, on Fridays and Saturdays, there's a group of folks that come here and they clean this place. There's toilet paper and a toilet paper roller. Man, there's nothing swirling around. You know what I'm saying? All right. It's clean. Some folks say it's cleaner than my house. Hey, listen, are they ministers of the gospel? Yeah. Amen. And we need to love on them and we need to care for them and encourage them. Amen, church? So listen, you don't walk out and say, all right, who, who didn't put enough toilet paper in here? Listen, you need to go and say, thank the Lord for that last strip of toilet paper. Amen? <laughs> but listen, you need to think of the positive things and be encouraging to those that are leaders within the church because the Word of God commands us to do that. I'm so thankful for every one of them. And I'm so thankful for a church that shows its love to the leaders within its church. Praise God for you. You want to know why Fellowship of the Hills is growing? Because it knows how to show love to the leadership in its church. I applaud you, and I love you for that. Well, let's see. Point number two. Point number two. Here it is. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 says, notice what he says here. Now, let's, let's not forget this. He talked about encouraging the leadership in the church. Now he's going to talk about encouraging other believers. Amen? So should we encourage one another? Listen, it's great to be encouraged as a leader, but you know what? We also encourage one another. Notice what he says in verses 14 through 15. He says, we urge you, brethren. Again, he's talking to brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, admonish the unruly. Woo! That's a tough one. How do you encourage someone that's unruly? Well, you just boot them out. No, I'm just kidding. We don't do that. You say, well, you'd like to. No, well, yeah, we would like to. You can't boot your children out of your house, can you? Do, do you still love your child? Yes or no? Do you still love your child? Well, I'll tell you what, as a parent, sometimes it's difficult, isn't it? To love them in a difficult situation doesn't mean that we take a stand for what's right. Doesn't mean we disip, doesn't doesn't mean that we don't discipline them, but we never lose sight of our love for them. Perfect example of that is the story of the what? The prodigal son. What did the prodigal son? He says, "Dad, give me everything. I want everything that belongs to me. I'm out of here." What does Dad say? No, you're staying right here till I tell you you can leave. What does Dad say? Okay, here it is. Go ahead. Did the father lose his love for his child? No, his, the son went out and did all those things he shouldn't have done. The word of God says he squandered everything. Messed it all up. He found himself living with pigs. Well, I know a lot of folks that leave their home and go out and live with pigs, and then they finally realize what the verse says about this young man, what says he came to himself. You can do, do whatever you can for your child. You can, you can enable them, which is the worst thing that you can do. Or you can pray for them, and sooner or later, there's going to come a time that they're going to come to themselves. Maybe your prayer should be, Lord, whatever it takes, put them in that position so they come to themselves. The Word of God says that young man came to himself and he returned home. 
What did the father do? What did he do? Did he do this? Did he say, you know what, son? You ticked me off when you left. You took everything. You know what? I don't think you've learned your lesson. You go out there and you, you when I tell you you can come home, you come home. What did the father do? He turned around. He says, you go kill the fatted calf. Go get me my ring. My son has come home. Amen, church. But you know what? We see that in some of our churches today, don't we? We say, hey, listen, when you get your act right, when you fix yourself, you can come back and hang with us. Y'all ever been in churches like that? Ever been around those kind of people? I had a young man not too long ago. I was at the gym, and I was talking to this young man. He was sharing with me his testimony, how he'd gotten off of methamphetamine. He said, man, Marty, he says, I was struggling with it. And he says, I want to thank God for him putting the right men in my path to help me through this problem because there was a time I wanted nothing to do with God. And I said, well, tell me how that happened. He says, well, I was about 16 years old. And he told me the name of the church which still exists here in Union County today. He says, I, as a young man, he says, ah, man, he says, I, my life was a mess. My home life was a mess. I was just trying to, to, trying to cope with meth. That was what was getting me through it. And he said, this other, this other teenager invited me to his church for a youth activity. He says, you know what? I'll give it a shot. I got nothing to lose. And he says he went to that church and he walked in. And it says the youth, he told me, he says, a youth pastor looked at me, says, your kind ain't welcome here. When you clean your act up, you can come back. And he says, I knew then I wanted nothing to do with this God they had. Let me tell you something, folks. As long as I'm the pastor of this church, we'll welcome anybody through them doors. And we will show the love of God to them, and we will encourage them in the love of God. Amen? And that young man said that, that, that God had put another man in his path that showed him love, what real love was, and worked him through this crisis in his life. And tell you that today this young man shares his testimony. And he shared it with me at the gym. He saw this little bracelet. God's got this. And it caught his eye, and we got to talking. Amazing. Amazing. But it's also amazing the damage the church can do when we don't encourage one another. But it says here that we admonish and warn the unruly, those that we consider to be idle and disruptive. And, and I put in my notes here, gossipers, those that are divisive. Did you know that it's not just the pastor's job to go to those that are causing dissension in the church? That, listen, we all have a responsibility. If someone comes to you and gossips, guess what you do? I don't want to hear that. Right. Amen, church? Amen. That's the easiest way to discipline that. I don't want to hear that garbage that you want to spew out about somebody else. First off, it may not be true. And if it is true, have you gone to that person and talked to them yourself? You see, in order for the church to be healthy, Paul was expressing to the church, don't allow abusive behavior to be tolerated within the church. We need to warn those that are doing that. We encourage them to be where? To be where God's called them to be in their heart. Amen, church? We don't boot them out. We put our arm around them and say, hey, listen, I need to talk to you a little bit. What you're doing right now, this is divisive. What you're doing right now, this is not only hurting someone else, but it's hurting you. Some of you may think as you look back in your past, maybe some churches you've been to, you, you can probably, maybe, maybe you can see their names or their faces. You know exactly who they were, those that tried to stir things up in the church. Amen? You want to have a healthy church? Don't allow that stuff to happen. You encourage what? Proper behavior. The love for one another. Don't allow abusive behavior. If we see or we hear something that's contrary to the Word of God, we need to make a note of that and, and bring it to that person in love. If we see or we hear something that's abusive and, and contrary to the leadership in the church, we go to that person through love and, and we share with them what God's called them to do with their right heart. Number two, notice this. Not only does he say that we urge you, brethren, to mosh and really, but he says we encourage you to encourage the faint-hearted. You know what that means? To encourage those that are discouraged. Now, I mentioned this this morning. Maybe it was in the prayer a moment ago. I said, you know, sometimes we have these blah days. Has anybody ever got up in the morning and you didn't know why you felt bad? You just felt bad? I have those days sometimes. I get up, sun shining, everything's beautiful outside. I'm a child of the king, and all of a sudden I say, ugh. Susan knows it because she'll say, man, you're grumpy today. And I go, no, I'm not. <laughs> you ever have those days? You don't know why you feel that way. You just feel that way. And so, you know, we, we hear that old cliche, you just got up on the wrong side of the bed. Listen, you may have someone that's just crossed your path and they're encouraged. You don't know why or they're, they're discouraged. You don't know why they're discouraged. You don't know why they're faint hearted. You don't know why they feel the way they do. You know what you can do? Give them a smile. 
Woo, man, it's amazing what a smile will do. Maybe give them a word of encouragement. You don't need to say, man, I don't know why you look so lousy, you feel so lousy, but I just need to pray for you. No. <laughs> No, we, we need to encourage one another. We don't know why they feel the way they do, and, and maybe they don't want to tell you. But you know what? Maybe that kind word, maybe that smile would be the very thing that they needed for that moment to get them through that time in their life. The Apostle Paul says we need to encourage the discouraged, to encourage the faint-hearted. Know what else he says here? Notice this. He says that we are to encourage and help the weak. Did you know that in every church family, every church body, there are those that are weak? Young Ben has challenged me to a competition, deadlift competition. I've been training very hard, Ben, for this competition. I may be old, but I'm not weak. <laughs> I hope you're ready, son. <laughs> listen, listen, he's not talking about physical strength, although there are some of us that are physically weak. And we, should we help one another? Yes or no, church? Absolutely. There are some of us in this church that as we age, boy, that's a tough thing. Uh, Lawson, where are you at? He's probably upstairs helping out. He said, Pastor Marty, where are you at, Lawson? Over there. Lawson asked me this morning, he said, Pastor Marty, did you get a haircut? I said, yeah, like six weeks ago. I told Susan this morning, I said, honey, it's not growing back. I don't know what to do. She says, honey, you're getting old. Yeah, there you go. Hey, listen. As we get older, we get weaker. Listen, are we not supposed to help those that are, that are more mature and more older? You know that there are some folks in here that can't do the lawn anymore. They can't cut the trees anymore. They can't rake the grass or throw the, the grass or throw the mulch out. Should we not as a church body that loves one another help them out? Does, would that not be encouraging? Listen, you can come to my house anytime you want cut my grass and spread mulch. You won't hurt my feelings one bit. And that will encourage me. I want to say something. Can I, I don't want to embarrass you, but I'm going to tell you what I was gone and Jeff sent me a little note. He said, pastor, he said, I'd like to get by and cut your grass while you're gone. Uh, man, I just can't tell you. I hope you got the note I sent back to you. I can't tell you what that means to me that someone would, would want to do that. But it rained every day. <laughs> but let me, let me tell you something. I can't tell you how much that meant to me. I can't tell you how much that meant to me. To know that a part of my family loved me so much that they would want to come cut my grass. It's not about how strong I am. It's about, you know, maybe there's just that thing that, that in that moment that I'm weak, I can't do something, I, I can't be there, and just to know someone loves me enough to take care of it. We have some folks in here that need that help. Did you know the Word of God also tells us as a church that we're to help our widows and take care of them? We've got several widows in this church, and we as a church body need to take care of them. That's right. We have some single moms, some single parents in this place. Boy, it's all they can do to make ends meet and to cope. We need to help them. We need to encourage them and, and show them God's love. So Paul says, listen, you won't be a healthy church. You admonish the unruly. You encourage the faint-hearted. You help the weak. And notice what else he says. Be patient with everyone. You can encourage others by being patient with them. Listen, I want you to pause right now. Pray for your pastor. This is where I need prayer. Patience is not my best suit. I want it done in right now. And there are some that I hold to my standard, and, and the Lord's had to convict me. Don't hold people, Marty, to your standard of perfectionism. Don't hold them to your standard of that they need to have all the spiritual and physical Red Bull that I have for you. Don't do that. Amen? But sometimes I lack patience. And, and you know when you're not patient with, patient with someone, you can frustrate them and you can discourage them? So I've had to learn to encourage folks by being patient. Amen, church? You see, some people aren't as gifted as the others. Some, some don't have the talents of others, but we want them to be like us so we don't have patience for them. We want them to, to, to be as well-versed in the Word of God as we are, and, and we need to be patient with them to walk them through the Word of God and, and to teach them things and, and not to be angry at them when they don't know what we know. We need to encourage them. Would you not agree with me, church? And, and, and by doing that, we need to be patient, the Word of God says, with everyone. So sometimes I need you to be patient with me. Amen, church? Pastor, when are we going to build that church? 
Next week, man. <laughs> and I'll say, whenever the Lord provides, whenever the Lord is ready, it'll happen. I remember when I was joking with Stuart as I was praying for a minister of music. And boy, I tell you what, uh, when you plan a church, there's one thing that you pray about every day. Lord, don't let me put a square peg in a round hole. But sometimes you'll do that if they're breathing. Just get somebody to do something. Prayed for eight years for God to bring us a minister of music that would love the Lord. And I'll never forget sitting with Stuart over there at, at the Cook's Restaurant and hearing his testimony. They had, him and Amy had already joined and united with this church. And he said, can I just share with you what God has done in my life? And then when he said, man, I can play the keyboard. I says, no kidding. <laughs> and this was on Monday. I'll never forget, it was on Monday. And, I, and he says, well, he says, uh, man, if you want me to, I'd be happy to take that burden from you and lead the music. Would you like me to do that? And I thought, well, I wonder how good he is. So I said, Stuart, I said, you want to bring your, bring your instruments and come on a Monday night? And I asked Brother David, I said, you come, David, you hook all the bells and whistles up. And we had some ladies that were working Operation Christmas Child upstairs. And we sat down here, and Stuart went over here, and he began to, it was a different keyboard, and he began to play it. And he says, what do you want to hear? I, I, I just started throwing some praise and worship music. Up. Okay. He started playing them, singing them. Buddy, I sat there, and I worshiped the Lord. And I began to weep. Because for eight years, I've been praying for that. And I wasn't patient. But at the right time in God's timing, he brought the right person because we have to be patient. God's getting ready to do an amazing thing in our evangelism and outreach. Just the other night I met with, along with the deacons with, with Brother Clayton. I knew Clayton. We've been supporting Clayton with full throttle ministries. But God had planned for Clayton and I to spend five days together in the same room. <laughs> I didn't know Clayton that well to sleep in the same room with him. But I'll never forget when he called and said, hey, listen, some guys were going to go on Daytona Bike, with, bike Week with me. They're not going. Think you might want to go. I said, I'd love to go. I got somebody else I think might want to go. I'll call you right back. And hours later, I called him. I said, Lord, you, you had this all planned out. I got a, I got a chance to be with someone man that I love doing and that's sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with. I got to know that man. I got to love that man. I got to hear him snore. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. He put on a CPAP, man. It was like looking at something like Dark Vader in Star Wars. <laughs> but let me tell you something. In God's timing, he brought the right person to do what I believe is going to be an amazing thing as we grow and evangelize and reach other people for Jesus Christ. We must be patient on the Lord. So that means we must be patient with everyone else. You want to see growth in the church? Be patient on the Lord. We're getting ready to celebrate 10 years in the life of this church. And I thought about this. I, I, I thought about it as, as I was looking at this, and, and I thought, Lord, wow, we're a church plant. It's almost 10 years old. We're no longer a church plant. We're a church that's growing in the name of Jesus Christ. And then I thought about, those others that call themselves church plant. Let me, let me just go back to something here real quick. I, I got to say this. Let me tell you what a church plant is not. A church plant is not someone that gets ticked off at another church and goes and starts a church. That's not a church plant. That's a church split that moved. Amen. This was a church plant. We came here to Blairsville knowing no one. I was being courted for another church, a very large church. And Susan and I prayed, and we just didn't feel that that's where God wanted us to be. God wanted us to start a new work in some place we didn't know anybody. And he sent us here. And I thought, why would you send us, Lord, to a place that's called the Bible Belt, the church belt? That's where I want you to go. It's okay. And all along the way, God provided the miracles from the house to, injury, to, to, to everything, to where we're at today to what took place on Pat Harrelson Road and giving us six acres of land. I don't know what he's got in store. don't know what he's going to do in the future, but I know this. I have learned to be patient on the Lord. I have learned that these are your people. Thank you for sharing them with me, Lord. Lord, I know you hold me accountable, but I must be patient with them. And Lord, I pray that they're patient with me and patient with you in how you work. Clayton said something a couple of weeks ago in a message. It's very important, very apropos for what I'm getting ready to share with you now. So many of us get so frustrated when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ and think, oh, I can't believe it. I must have failed at that moment they didn't accept Christ. Let me tell you something. God had you right where he wanted you to be in planting the seed. 
And then he'll send someone else to water it and to to nourish it and to, to mature it. And then he'll send someone else to harvest it. But let me tell you what, you are just as important. So be patient on the Lord. Be patient with one another. You want, to, you want to see a healthy church as we be a church that's encouraging? Then we must be patient. And last, but certainly not least, I, I want to sum it up by saying this. The very last thing that Paul wrote to us as we see this in this verse, he says, see that no one repays one another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. So as we encourage one another, listen, we what? We want to do good even to those that hurt us. Wow, that is tough in the ministry. That's tough outside. We expect people to hurt us out there. Amen, church? But we don't expect that in here. Now, come on. Let's be honest. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Anybody in this church ever said something nasty about somebody else in this church? Come on. No. Has anybody... Come on. Come on. Let me see who you are. Has anybody ever said anything? Come on. I won't look. Has anybody ever said anything bad about the pastor? I'm looking on the screen. See if I... Hey, listen, are there going to be people that hurt you? Yes or no? Absolutely. So what do you do? I want to get back. It's kind of natural, isn't it? We want to get back at them. Wow. Word of God says that we don't repay evil for evil. Now, I want you to write this down. If there's anything to get out of this morning, I want you to write this down. Please write this down. Listen. Your response, your response to the person that hurt you may be worse than the evil they did to you. Now I want you to grasp that for a moment. Your response to how that person hurt you may be worse than the very evil that was done to you. Pastor, how can that be true? Has anybody ever been wronged And you call that person, and you just let them have it. And then you thought you felt so good afterward, but you didn't. Because at that very moment, you hurt your testimony. Maybe you were out in public, and and it was just the right time to catch that person that hurt you, and, and now's my chance. And you let them have it. And then all around the corner, someone heard what you said. And it hurt your testimony in Christ. Maybe you went on a physical part of this. Maybe you said, you know what? Next time I see that person, I'm going to let them have it right between the eyes. Pow! There you go. You let them have it. (laughs) And then you get locked up. How's that working for you? I mean, really? So then you've lost your freedom. The Word of God says, listen, we don't repay evil for evil. You know, and that's one of the most difficult things we do. And I, I begin to think about the Lord, what does that mean? Lord, Lord, how, how do, we, how do we, we're a growing church, people are going to do us wrong. Lord, how do, we, how do we not want to get back at them? How do we not want revenge? Lord, how do we love those that we've, we've cared for and we've loved on? All of a sudden, they just want to stick that knife in our back. How do we do that? And he says, remember what I did on the cross. I said, oh, come on, Lord, really? He says, Yeah. You know what I began to think about? And I want you to think about this with me. Here we go. Jesus. All the power of God willingly gave of himself to be arrested. As the centurions took him and they laid him across whatever it was, a rock or a stump. And then he told the soldier with a cat of nine tails, with glass and, and rock and, and all kinds of trash that was in this whip. And as he cracked that whip across Jesus' back for the first time, I want you to think with me just for a moment. The power of God was laying across that rock or that stump as his back was being stripped of its very flesh. Now i got to be honest with you. Had that been me, You'd have cracked that whip on my back one time, and if I'd have had the power of God, I'd have turned around, and I'd have wrapped that that whip around your neck and choked you out, had that been me. But that wasn't me. That was Jesus. 
And then they took Jesus as he carried his cross. And they laid the cross down. And they laid Jesus down on the cross he willingly gave of himself with all the power of God. And that man held a nail and he took his hammer and he drove that spike through the first hand of Jesus. You see, had that been me, I'd have grabbed that spike and I'd have stuck it right in you. But it wasn't me. It was Jesus. And then you know what they did? They took my Jesus, the power of God, and, and they, but they put that cross as Jesus was hanging on the cross in a hole. And as it sank into the ground, it literally ripped his flesh. And then you know what happened? Jesus took upon himself your sin and my sin and the sin of all humanity. And as he was hanging there, the sky grew dark. And Jesus cried out, My Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? At that very moment, God the Father could not look at his Son because of the sin he had taken upon himself for you and for me. You see, had that been me, I'd have jumped off that cross and I said, not a one of them's worth it. Just take them all. But it wasn't me. It was Jesus. You know what Jesus is telling his church? He's going to say, there are going to be those that hurt you. Let me tell you what. I went onto the cross for him and for her and for her and for him. And if I can do it, you can love them just like I love them. You pray for them, and you love them, and you care for them just like I love and I care for you. So let me ask you a question. Are you part of the church of the encouraged? Are you part of the church of the encouraged? You see, Paul was speaking to the brothers and sisters. He was speaking to the brethren of the church. This morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the very one I spoke of that went to the cross for you, you can have that this morning. You can be part of the brethren. Go to, go to the Lord in prayer with me. Father, wow, I am so blessed. I'm so thankful, Father, that I have a physical family. And oh, I love my family. And Father, I love my grandchildren that are here with me right now. I, I, Lord, there is nothing that I would not do for any of them. There is nothing that they could do that could ever separate my love for them. Nothing. But oh, Lord, that there's just no comparison in how much you love me and how much you love us. And Father, as you had given these words for Paul to pen on, on to be the church of the encouraged. To be a church, Lord, that exemplifies the very love of Jesus Christ by how we love one another. These people outside these doors are watching how we love one another. My goodness, if we can't love one another, how can we love the unlovable? And Father, there are some in this room that maybe right now as I pray this prayer, they're, they have an awe against someone. They have a, a difference. A, a, Father, something that's frustrated them, discouraged them. Oh Lord, I pray that this very moment that they'll come to your throne room. In the name of Jesus Christ, say, Jesus, forgive me of that. Lord, open up an avenue. Open up a way that I can go in and be an encourager to this person that maybe have hurt me or that I have hurt. Lord, this morning as I was listening to this message, I know that there are those in this room that, Lord, I need to be an encourager by, by helping them. By, Lord, I, I have two strong arms and, and two strong feet, and, and Lord, I can go and help this person. I want to be that kind of encourager. Lord, you spoke to my heart today to do that. Lord, I'm that one that at times goes and says things about people. I'm kind to that one that's unruly, Lord, and I need your forgiveness. Because, Lord, I want to be an encourager. I don't want to be a discourager. 
maybe you're that one this morning that says, boy, pastors, I was listening to this. I want, I want that kind of family. I want a family that loves me so much that no matter what happens in my life, they're going to love me. They're going to encourage me. Even when I have a blah day. Oh, I want to be a part of that family. Pastor, how do I do that? Well, my dear friend, I shared with you about Jesus. And this morning, the Word of God says that if we'll just come to Him and say, Jesus, I believe in what you did on the cross. I believe that, Jesus, you took my sin. You willingly gave of yourself, and you took my sin upon the cross, and you shed your blood for me. Jesus, I believe that. Jesus, I believe you're the only one that had the power to do that as the Son of God. So, Jesus, I receive your payment for my sin. Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. At this very moment, I accept you. I accept your salvation that I have through your blood. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. And from this moment on, I belong to you. My dear friend, when you accept the payment that Jesus has given you, when you believe that Jesus Christ is your only way of salvation, and you've accepted that, and you've gone to Him, and you've asked Him to forgive you, you've asked Him to be the Lord of your life, He has given you a gift that no man can give you, and that's the gift of eternal life. The Word of God says He came to give us life and to give us abundant life. He has a new life for you here on this earth. The Word of God says, old things are passed away, all things become new. That was the picture of what you saw in baptism this morning. It's exactly what these three people shared with you, is that they received that gift of eternal life. They've received salvation. Their lives will never be the same. They're part of this very family that I've talked to you about today, the Church of the Encouraged.